and welcome to CCAD 1998. This is tape number three. this morning. Uh, let me make one announcement. If you did not indicate on your registration that you would be staying for the Saturday morning breakfast uh, with our spiritual speaker, then you need to check with Pat Fields at the registration desk and please let her know if you're planning on being here Saturday morning but did not indicate so on your registration. We need to know how many people are going to be there. So if you've not done that, please do so. Uh, welcome to another CCAD. I'm Dr. Jim Finley. I'm the chairman of CCAD this year. Um, I'm going to repeat myself a little bit, but I want to make sure that everyone hears this. Um, uh, we're in concurrence right now, and I'll say this again. We do our first plenary in the following hour, but I, I want to say a couple of things about CCAD itself. Uh, our new CCAD begins the day after our old CCAD finishes. and there are a couple of things that we try to do uh, with this conference yearly. Uh, one is we want to expose people in the field to the camaraderie, friendship, fellowship that comes with doing this kind of work by having a chance to get together. Two is we want to reignite that passion for treating this disease, which I think all of us have to some degree, or we don't last very long in this field. And three, we talk about this being a simple program, but I think the talent of anyone working in the field of addiction is to keep it simple, yet have a large fund of information to choose from to know what specific thing is going to work for that patient. I encourage you to ask questions while you're here. I encourage you to make the most of your time here, uh, and we welcome you all. Our first presenter this morning is Martin Wutke. Mr. Wutke is founder and clinical director of the Southern Institute of Psychophysiology. He is a member of the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback, the Society for the Study of Neuronal Regulation, and the National Registry of Neurofeedback Providers. Don't you love the way those names roll off on those? That's great. Mr. Wetke is a frequent presenter on biofeedback, and he will be speaking to us on alternative therapies and addiction. Uh, please welcome Martin Wetke. Thank you. I want to start off by saying that even though the name of um, the presentation is Alternative Therapies, um, the therapy that I'm going to talk about today is really more of an additional therapy, pre-existing therapy. And I'll explain that in a little bit more detail as I go through my talk this morning um, about how this modality fits in, what are the best supports for it, and so on. I just wanted to state that initially so you kind of understand that this is not as much of an alternative as it is an addition, an intervention when added to a traditional recovery program or treatment program greatly increases recovery rate. Okay. Uh, I need to give you a little, bit, a little bit of background about myself, how I got here, um, the generation of the profession and the methodology that I, I'm using now. Uh, two decades ago, October 1978, uh, my own recovery began. And my recovery began essentially uh, as a result of a spiritual awakening experience that lasted, best I can tell, about 90 seconds. Before that, I had been through uh, eight treatment programs. Uh, this was in New York, um, multiple interventions that uh, by and large didn't produce much change. A drug of choice was heroin and cocaine and alcohol to kind of hold me over in between uh, fixes. So in 1978, uh, 
during a period of crisis, uh, one specific moment, I surrendered, finally. And as a result of that surrender, a spiritual awakening occurred. And from that point on, my life was, was transformed. So I started to ask a lot of questions at that point. The number one question was, what is spiritual awakening? What is that transformation? What happens in the addict's brain when that process occurs? And I began looking hard. So about 15 years ago, I uh, accepted a job at Woodridge Psychiatric Hospital Addiction Treatment Center which is now closed, as many treatment centers are, uh, under the direction of Dr. Richard Turner, the late Dr. Richard Turner. And for nine years, Dr. Turner gave me the luxury of directing and designing a portion of our treatment program then that was primarily focused on correcting the neurophysiology of the brain in addiction. Because by and large, the answer to some of my questions about recovery was that we really haven't addressed that correctly. We know that we have to be abstinent, we know that we have to go to meetings, we know that we have to do all those things that are important to maintain sobriety. But for the most part, we have not addressed the fundamental neurophysiology of the brain, and specifically the addict's brain. Because there are some clear distinguishing characteristics aside from genetics, aside from some of these markers, distinguishing characteristics about how the addict's brain is working that is driving that addict towards addiction. Primarily, we're talking about the limbic system and the pain-pleasure-reward system. And fundamentally, when you look at those areas of the brain, you can see that all behavior is driven by the need to avoid pain. And that, in terms of neurophysiology, addiction is really a survival mechanism. As Doug Talbot says, yes, the chemical filter is broken. And the addict is driven from a survival perspective towards drugs or behavior that have lethal and adverse consequences. So, what does that mean? How can we look at that mechanism and correct that mechanism? Well, Recovery will correct that mechanism. But my goal was to speed up that process, to readjust the neurophysiology of the brain so that recovery, sobriety, and even spiritual awakening could be dramatically accelerated. So for nine years, uh, we treated about 1,500 patients, inpatients, ranging from depression, dual diagnosis, uh, and all types of addiction, eating disorders, gambling, alcoholism, crack cocaine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we began to see that our results were correlating with other clinicians and other researchers' results around the country. About five years ago, I left uh, Woodridge Hospital. And the reason I left was twofold. One, because the addiction field at that point was uh, insurance companies were not paying for addiction treatment. That's what you know. But the other reason was we began to gather research showing that some of the markers for addiction occur early on in life. And to underline that, brain injury, attention deficit disorder, and learning disability are huge markers, st statistically significant number of these kids end up self-medicating, end up being drawn or driven towards addiction. So, right now, I still consult with addiction treatment programs. Um, I still teach this method as an application for addiction treatment. But by and large, my focus is on children because we're in sort of a tricky situation right now if you read the newspapers, watch the news, uh, we're really heavily medicating our kids now. It's not uncommon for me to get a six-year-old in who's on three or four different medications. And I'm not anti 
you know, I'm not anti riddle and I'm not anti any of these medications, but I am pro human potential. I am pro, I am for, I should say, the fact that I've seen brains change through a training process, and that training has resulted in a profound alteration in those person's behavior, in their physiology, and in their ability to maintain their sobriety. So, the long and short of it is most of my practice now is with kids with brain injury, autism, attention deficit disorder, learning disabilities. I'm trying to head some of these problems off. Okay. So on to the presentation. Um, essentially, I'm going to be talking about EEG biofeedback. There are a couple of different ways I'm going to say EEG biofeedback, and let me just try to, try to tie them all together. EEG biofeedback, neurofeedback, and neurotherapy are all the same thing, essentially. First, you have to understand a basic concept behind this method. And the concept has to do with biofeedback. Very simple. Any biological mechanism that we can measure that's occurring within your body in real time, be it your muscle tension, the blood flow to your fingers, which is measured as skin temperature, your perspiration, your heart rate, your blood pressure, any one of those mechanisms that we measure and feed back to you, you can learn how to gain control of them fairly quickly, fairly simply. So we've taken that principle a step further, and I'll talk about the generation of this in a minute. We are looking at the brain, fundamental to the brain for these electrical rhythms that reflect how the brain is working. EEG stands for electroencephalography, which some of you people are familiar with, some of you folks have probably even had EEG. The EEG is recording specific activity that occurs at specific sites in the brain that tells us how that brain is working. And yes, with chemically dependent people, with addicts, with kids who are attention deficit disorder, there are clear signatures, clear markers that show us that that brain is not working correctly. There's a fundamental neurochemistry, neurophysiology, in that brain that is broken. It's not working. So the key is that we can take that feedback from that person's brain and begin to show that person when their brain is shifting in a desired direction, literally when the brain is processing, when the brain is working better, and teach somebody how to do that. When you look at people in recovery, when you look at spiritually aware people, when you look at enlightened people, there are clear markers in their EEG that show that their brain is working differently than people who are addicted, etc., etc., etc. There's a book coming out next year, it's in the press right now, called Symphony of the Brain, which um, if you folks are really interested in this, write that title down. So if you go into detailed description, of the emergence of this new science, this new way of looking at healing. I was thinking this morning about the term chemically dependent. Every being on this planet that has a brain is chemically dependent, right? Our neurotransmitters are always in a delicate flux and a delicate balance. But what we've discovered is that through this feedback technique, we can coax the brain into that balance, literally change neurochemistry. Okay. Some of the initial pioneers in the field, one of the initial pioneers in the field was Barry Sturman. Retired now, worked out at um, the VA Center in Sepulveda, California. Barry was doing research for NASA, and he found that in his work or studies with cats, believe it or not, that the cats could be taught to produce a brainwave rhythm that would inhibit seizures. What he was doing in these animal experiments was exposing the cats to toxic chemicals, the pest seizure threshold. But the appropriate feedback, EEG biofeedback, he found that the cats could, in, 
continuously inhibit that threshold to see your activity, which began the generation, or the proof rather, that you can teach a human being as well as a cat to change their EEG pattern, to literally change their chemistry. Right now, the, even though most of seizure treatment is with medication, EEG biofeedback is still used around the country, around the world, and has demonstrated a 60% reduction in seizure activity. So literally, a person learns to alter their EEG, alter their neurochemistry, and inhibit the seizure activity. Eugene Peniston was another pioneer in this field, worked at the Fort Lyon VA Center in Colorado. He began uh, back in 1989, 1988, to use the EEG biofeedback in patients with chronic stage 4 VA alcoholics. Follow-up studies showed an 80% success rate, an 80% recovery rate with these folks who he treated. And I should say that Gene Peniston got his training at the Menninger Clinic out in Topeka, Kansas. That was sort of the hub back then for EEG biofeedback. Follow-up studies by Penister continued to prove the efficacy. Alpha Theta Brainwave Neurofeedback Therapy for Vietnam Veterans with Combat-Related PTSD published in Medical Psychotherapy. Again, an 80% recovery rate with a 26-month follow-up. And now these recovery rates are continuing to maintain. They may have dropped a percentage or two, but essentially, we're seeing that with the addition of this therapy, again, to a traditional treatment model, recovery rates rapidly accelerate. And I will talk about why that is in a minute. Another important landmark was the work of Douglas A. Quirk, who was deceased, passed away this past year. This is from a paper, Conditioning in Dangerous Offenders, on the Ontario Correctional Institute. Quirk showed that with the addition of EEG biofeedback, and particularly the correlate was with the number of sessions these subjects received, recidivism rates drastically changed, went down, down, down. This is being used in a couple of correctional institutes around the country right now. God knows that chemical dependency, attention deficit disorder, and brain injury are rampant. If you look at the criminal population, EEG studies show that 90% of the inmates have abnormal EEGs. 90%. So to treat them behaviorally, to treat them with the kind of punishment that we're using now, obviously not working. So Quirk's work was really landmark and is being looked at very carefully because it gives us a way to actually rehabilitate people from the perspective of their brain. And when you rehabilitate, I haven't said this yet, when you rehabilitate a brain, you're rehabilitating behavior. You're rehabilitating personality. That's what the brain does. It moderates all of now, I'm not trying to reduce human beings down to their brain, but again, neurochemistry is the source of our moods, our attention, our consciousness, our awareness, etc. So the key points. Number one, it greatly reduces the first years of the emotional roller coaster, the white knuckle syndrome. You'll see, uh, there's a couple, Gene Penniston actually did this study, that in the first year of recovery, if you look at stress chemicals in the blood and in the saliva, they continue to rise. Obsessive compulsive behavior gets worse and worse. In that first year of recovery, that's so hard. So with the addition of EEG biofeedback, we are rapidly able to correct that mechanism, to de-stress that individual, to produce a brain change that correlates with serenity. Fundamental to the, to the job of the addict's job in recovery is to 
seek serenity, obviously, but not to seek that serenity from a source outside of itself. EEG biofeedback is a training. It's a training process. It doesn't do anything to the individual. Rather, the individual learns how to go within their own mind, within their own body, and produce the neurophysiology of serenity. And that's an important key. It also resolves unconscious issues. I'll get into that a little bit later on, why that works, how that works. It improves cognitive functioning. As I mentioned, most of my work now, a large portion of it, I should say, is with brain injury for the improvement of cognitive function. The faster the frequency, the more aroused the state. Well, what does that mean? Well, the EEG is measured in frequency. There's little lines on the EEG that go up and down. What you will see in the chemically dependent person is an excess of high frequency activity that we call beta. Beta is an indicator that the central nervous system is in a chronic state of hyperarousal, always on guard, always watching, always depleting its own stress chemicals, hence the need to find relief from a chemical outside of the body. Traditional therapy says, talk about it and you can feel better. NT, which stands for neurotherapy, says, feel better, then you can talk about it. Let's change the neurophysiology first. Okay? The best candidates for neurofeedback, number one, normal to high function, the peak performance model. Athletes are beginning to get into this methodology. People with anxiety disorders and chemical dependency respond very well. Obsessive compulsive disorder. Symptoms of depression. Why? Well, depression is clearly measured on an EEG. You can quantify or qualify 80% of depression patients just by looking at their EEG. Right frontal, or, I'm sorry, left frontal. Deactivation of the left frontal lobe, which has to do with affect, with mood, with organization, goal plan, motivation, and with understanding the consequences of behavior. And you'll see in a depressed individual, that part of the brain is not functioning correctly. Hence, the application of EEG biofeedback as an intervention for depression. People institutionalize, it works a lot better when it's done inpatient. And the reason is because the protocol calls for sessions twice a day. When you begin to work in partial programs, halfway houses, um, outpatient, it's a little bit more difficult. Okay? People that are very impulsive and reactive, again, that reflects in a particular brainwave pattern. Now, in the chemically dependent, the question is why change the EEG? And I've mentioned this several times. Because typical CD brainwaves, excessive beta and excessive high beta. So attention is always on the outside, is always searching, scanning, always being prepared in that fight or flight mode, fight or flight mechanism. Does everybody know what that is? The primitive mechanism in the brain that gets triggered fairly um, inconveniently for the addict. And that the triggering of that mechanism prepares the body to either fight perceived attacker or to run away from the perceived attacker or situation. Again, that drives the individual from a neurochemical standpoint to find relief. And the relief that many of us seek, unfortunately, comes in the form of a chemical from the outside. There'll also be deficient alpha and deficient beta. And these are designations of specific brainwave activity. Alpha essentially has to do with the ability to idle, to calm the mind, and just to let the physiology simply relax. When alpha and theta are deficient, what you'll see is a person who has a high level of defense mechanisms going on. We call it resistance. The inability to drop those defenses, to drop that resistance, is almost equal the amount of alpha and theta that that person has. 
So our goal with EEG biofeedback is really fairly simple. We're seeking to reduce the excessive high beta activity and to increase the deficient alpha and the deficient theta in that individual. How do we do that? Well, we measure the brain wave and we set parameters around those brain waves when they begin to change in the desired direction. We use feedback to tell the client when the EEG is changing. It can be sound, it can be visual, it can be tactile. Sometimes we use a combination of all three. But again, it's a training process. It's fairly simple. The client is hooked up to a computer and electrodes or sensors are placed on the scalp in the appropriate areas. We use different areas on the scalp for different reasons. Again, for instance, with depression, we'll use left frontal. If somebody is in a chronic state, we may go to the right hemisphere, which moderates arousal. For alpha theta training, when we're really trying to teach somebody to go into a deep, deep, profound state of meditation, of relaxation, we will go to the back of the brain, or the occipital region, or the parietal region, to train alpha. So, we look at these different bandwidths. Hertz just stands for how many cycles per second that frequency is occurring in. Delta is 2 to 5 hertz, the slowest brainwave activity. Theta, 5 to 8 hertz. Alpha, 8 to 11. SMR stands for something called sensory motor rhythm. Going back to the researcher I mentioned earlier, Barry Sturman, who worked with the epilepsy, sensory motor rhythm has been proven to be the rhythm that inhibits seizure-like activity, inhibits tic disorder, inhibits Tourette's disorder, the activity that goes along with that. Beta, 15 to 18 hertz, and I will get into specifically what these all mean. Broad beta, 15 to 30. High beta, 22 to 30 hertz. So we look specifically at all those frequencies. And on the computer system, this is actually what the therapist is watching. This is theta, and this is alpha, and this is beta. Those little dotted lines there are called thresholds, and essentially what those are are like hurdles. So we will set those dotted lines. We can adjust them to keep these brain waves either within or without certain parameters. In other words, when the freak or the amplitude of the brain wave activity pops up above that threshold, the computer gives feedback, and the person knows, well, now I'm doing what they're asking me to do. Now my brain is making those shifts. And we'll actually look at several different frequencies at the same time. And our goal is to raise the amplitude of certain frequencies and to decrease the amplitude of certain frequencies. So again, going back to those specific frequencies, delta orientation. And that's what delta would look like in a one second, one second picture of an EEG. We inhibit delta between 10 and 20% after theta raises above alpha, which is called crossover, which I'll talk about in a minute. This helps to prevent sleep, prevents painful ab reactions, and is usually dominant in the individuals who have lots of ab reactive phenomena going on multiple personality or DID and post-traumatic stress disorder. The next frequency is theta, 5 to 8 hertz. We reward theta between 25 and 40 percent of the time during the session. The clients will report a lighter experience. They will begin to develop that witness state, that sitting back from their thoughts, sitting back from those reactive or reflexive phenomena that occur in their body. And what I mean by that are, are or flashbacks, um, memories, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When they maintain the theta state, there's a dissociation from that, and rather than go into the whole physiology that occurs with an ab reaction or with a flashback, they're away from it, watching it, which rewires the brain. Of course, they report feeling better and be less dissociated after the sessions. Alpha, however, is the most important brainwave frequency to reward 
with addiction and chemical dependency. We reward it between, in other words, when I say we, we, we reward it, we're rewarding the generation or the increase in that activity in the brain, okay? And it's important that it's rewarded at a specific percentage of time because that's how the client learns to create more and more and more. <clears throat> it's an awake yet restful state, calm, laid back, feels very good to produce, and most chemicals, in fact, will artificially elevate alpha activity. So we're teaching them how to do that, how to do that themselves. The next frequency I mentioned is sensory motor rhythm, 12 to 15 hertz, rewarded between 60 and 80 percent of the time. This is a frequency or a, a, a brainwave activity that we reward. In that state, the client has the ability to really change fundamental imagery that is occurring within their mind. Specifically, what we use in terms of guided imagery is very simple hypnotic techniques like see yourself around one of your triggers and see yourself being neutral to that trigger. We use scenes of abstinence. We use scenes of dealing with anger. We use uh, several different scenes. Again, it depends on the individual. Alpha Theta is then started with guided, guided imagery being read during the first five minutes of every session. The sessions generally last 30 to 35 minutes total. 
The client eventually becomes satisfied with the improved functioning, and it correlates with the post-testing that we do. Uh, generally, the number of alpha-theta sessions is about 30, 30 training sessions. 10 additional sessions, usually for overlearning, and they're booster sessions that we will do over time, maybe over a year or two. We won't do them as uh, like the guerrilla warfare that we're doing when we do two sessions a day. And then the client completes training, and some clients will move on to the peak performance model, which um, would take me a long time to try to explain that, but that's for another lecture. The impact clinically. Increased honesty with self and others. New and clear insights in their role in the recovery process. Better integration of step work. Significantly more stable emotionally and cognitively. And an interesting phenomenon occurs, an allergy reaction to alcohol. Um, in several of the studies, if the, the uh, participants relapsed, they would report significant flu-like symptoms. Some neurophysiologists looked at those flu-like symptoms, and essentially it looked like allergic reactions to alcohol, almost like in what happens with an abuse. Uh, if they want to overcome that and continue drinking, they can eventually turn that mechanism off. But it's a real interesting phenomena that occurs with people who go through the training. Normalization in the MMPI-2 of one to two standard deviations, which is significant. And finally, increased abstinence rates by two to three times over traditional treatment alone. Okay. Now, I mentioned crossover before. I just want to point out what that means. When somebody sits and closes their eyes, you'll see that their alpha generally becomes the dominant EEG activity, and theta becomes the subdominant activity. What we actually teach the individuals to do is halfway through a session for alpha begin to drop off and theta to begin to rise. When that happens, it's like a door to the unconscious opens. And if that individual refuses, denies, defends against all of that material, they won't go into that crossover. But see that right there? That's what surrender is. That's what letting go is. That's the ability to allow the mind just to calm to quiet and for all that stuff that's down in there to come up, but to come up in a different way. I'm not talking about you know, some of the talk therapy that some of you may have seen where somebody abreacts, goes into a flashback, decompensates. This is a different process. The physiology is in a deep, profoundly calm, quiet state. So when this occurs, there is a change in those, in those neurological mechanisms that have to do with those stress responses, to those physiologic responses that you see when somebody decompensates. Very important. The typical initial session will look like this. Alpha is the blue line, theta is the pink line, and don't worry about that green line. So the, the first session, this is a 30-minute session, alpha will tend to be the dominant rhythm, and the client will be sitting there listening to the tones and making attempts to sort of let go and surrender. But for the most part, the initial session um, is just really an orientation to the process, and they're getting used to it. But with training, they learn how to eventually go into that state. Some people will call it reverie. Some people will call it meditation. Um, some people will just call it deep, profound relaxation. But eventually, again, they are taught to allow that alpha to drop, and this occurred within the first 10 minutes of the session, and then to allow that theta to begin to come up and up and up, and again, that's the crossover experience, that's the surrender experience, that's the letting go experience. And again, see, what you're seeing, what the EEG reflects is neurochemistry. It's neurochemistry. It's a neurochemical change, not a change in brainwave rhythms. Brainwave rhythms are just reflecting a neurochemical change. Okay? In an abstinent EEG, if you look at 
the results of each session, this is 31 sessions, I don't know if you can see that, but each, each line here is a session. And what it's showing is that theta begins to change accordingly with each session, get higher and higher. With a relapse EEG, and again, this correlates with this person's inability to really let go. Alpha remained the dominant frequency throughout these 19 sessions. The person was just simply not able to let go, not able to go into that process. And consequently, was not able to get into the recovery. So, essentially, to sum up, the process allows patients to experience the benefits of longer-term sobriety in a shorter period of time, to create those profound fundamental shifts in their neurophysiology that a good solid recovery will produce over time, but it's a way to point the person's brain towards that process. I want to show you just one more picture here, and then I'll go ahead and take questions. Um, this was a, one of our interesting cases. Now, this graph here uh, looks a little bit complicated, but it's, it's really not. There's a way to look at EEG activity called spectral analysis. And what you're looking at is a three-dimensional picture, and this is a normal spectral analysis of an EEG. The red mountain peaks here are alpha activity. The higher frequency activity is up here, and the lower frequency activity is back here, okay? So that's what a normal one should look like. Now, this was a case that we treated back in 1993. This was a 32-year-old uh, uh, male, 43, I'm sorry, 43-year-old male, who um, he went through the usual generation of addiction, um, got suicidal about 20 years old, made several suicide attempts. Before he came into our hospital, he made his final suicide attempt where he took a high-caliber pistol and put it to his temple, shot, missed his brain but severed his optic nerve so it was blind at that point. And this activity up here, these mountain peaks, these huge mountain peaks by the way, are beta activity. This is somebody who when he walked into the room, you could feel the stress, the tension, the incredible anger. At the point that he came into our hospital, his seeing eye dog stopped participating with him because of that anger, that rage that he was exuding. We had to work with the dog, too, as, as well as him. Very interesting. Not with the EG biofeedback, but retrain the dog. So, now this is somebody who's highly resistant, wanted to die, didn't want to be in treatment. And frankly, I didn't, you know, the, the uh, psychiatrist referred him to me and said, okay, see what you can do with this fellow. I said, all right. So, his first session, he cursed and swore at us and said, what are you doing? What are you putting on my head? And we just said, humor us. You're going to hear some tones. We just want you to see if you can make more of those tones. So two days later, I saw a profound change in his EEG where all that high activity started to drop. Again, this is electrochemical. This is a change or a shift in neurochemistry, in neurotransmitters. That's what you're literally seeing here. So I saw that drop, and it was correlating with some of his behavior. Two days later, or rather three days later, we saw the EEG of almost a normal brain. We were doing sessions twice a day, so it was uh, pretty intense. And then a couple of days later, the EEG continued to normalize again, which is indicative of the brain's neurochemistry normalizing. So just to show you what the old one looked like compared to the last one that we did, okay? That's a significant change, significant change. You almost can't even get that much of a change with medication. Medication will, of course, affect the EEG, but that's a profound change, a profound change in that person's neurological system. He's now running a halfway house for the blind, okay? All right, in the interest of time, I have to stop talking here and take questions. So any questions? Yeah, there's, there's ongoing studies with that, and the, the, the only two ways that those changes will uh, go backwards 
is if that person relapses, obviously, and starts using a lot, or if there's a head injury. People who remain abstinent and who've gone through the training, you'll see their EEG actually continue to improve. Will continue to improve with follow-up studies. Yeah. We will start them on the feedback with medication. Then as we see changes occur, and, and for some people we'll, we'll do a testing every few sessions, as we see changes occur and testing performance improve, we'll begin to titrate them off of medication. Well, we'll yeah, we'll use other tests usually, other tests. We'll use blood tests. For instance, with lithium, we measure lithium le levels fairly frequently because you'll see people get toxic with lithium fairly quickly. Blood pressure medication, we have to watch carefully, and obviously we can monitor, monitor those things in other ways. And then we, we will do TOVA tests, though, off medication. We'll do a lot of our testing off medication. We'll usually do a 24-hour washout to get baseline. Okay. been through about 12 treatment programs before that um, so we know he had carried people around him before but again this is not a magic bullet okay and clearly it's it's a synergistic modality that when you combine it with caring and with good program implementation and meetings etc etc it speeds up that process of recovery mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to go through a training process. Right, right, right. Right, yeah, there's... Yeah, there, there, it's required to have a, a, a two-year health degree initially, and then you can, there's lots and lots of certification hours and prerequisites and so on that you have to go through to become certified. I'm sorry, I, I didn't get that. Electrodes? Oh, will, will you, if, if they're, you know, if they have a problem with ethyl alcohol or isopropyl alcohol, we'll use a different kind of preparation. Yeah, no, you can use different kinds of preparation. Did you have a question? Uh, uh, you said that uh, the brain waves that the, the sensitivity increases over time, that it is progressive, but the change in the EEG really correlates with a, a different ability to handle stress, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I don't know that you can tie the two together. I think it is the disease is progressive, and you, and you will see sensitivities with this training actually increase, to, even to caffeine. People who drink a pot a day can only drink a half a cup, is what you'll see happen. Very interesting. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't hear you. I know. 
Yeah, there's definitely a trend. Insurance companies, um, little by little, it's not a huge trend, but they're actually coming to, to us um, and looking at alternatives now. And again, the, the, there's a big controversy now with, with medicating our kids. You know. Yeah, it, it's still frustrating, but it's changing. It's changing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Motivation. Right. Well, motivation, you know, is a, is a function of specific areas of the brain. And when somebody's amotivational, you'll see that those parts of the brain really aren't firing. Um, so it's sort of a subversive effect that we get. You know, we just say, we're going to put this electrode here, you're going to make a bunch of beeps, and you're going to see what happens. And again, with testing, you'll see that motivation increases, focus increases, concentration increases, etc. Again, that's why it's used re as a rehabilitative method for brain injury, because that, that's, what the, that's what motivation is, the function of the frontal lobes, the executive functions of those parts of the brain. Okay. Anybody else? Um, somehow our handouts did not make it into the packets. So at booth number 608, at the WENS Education and Counseling, we'll have some of our information there. I want to mention one more thing, too, to watch for you folks who read the um, publications, the various publications. Uh, there will be a study coming out, a 12 to 18 month post-treatment abstinence study on, um, from a program called Cry Help out in California. They have a 50% uh, recovery rate. The, uh, the uh, clients were crack, heroin, and methamphetamine patients. So that one's probably going to hit pretty big here within the year. And it will raise the interest again and so on and so on. And people will begin to pursue this as an additional therapy to their treatment programs. Yep. Symphony of the Brain. Um, Jim, Ro Jim Robbins? Jim Robbins. Excuse me? Should be out um, next fall. Next fall. It's going to be a very large book going into detail about this whole science. Do you have another question? Okay. Yeah. Early on, is a, there's an excess of stress chemicals. Um, because of that, that pain reward syndrome, uh, what the brain is experiencing is a survival response. It's, it's, its primitive impulse is to go back to those chemicals as a source of stress relief. They're outside of the body. It's not producing its own yet. And you'll see that chronic state of hyperarousal that um, white knuckle syndrome, that, uh, that sort of obsessive drive to get some kind of relief. And if somebody hangs in there and goes to meetings, follows their program and so on, they'll make it through those phases. But again, what we can do with the EEG biofeedback, on a very fundamental level, is turn that off. And turn that mechanism off through the feedback mechanism. Or teach, I should say teach the person how to turn it off. Right, we really don't do anything to them. Okay. Yeah, norepinephrine as well. Okay, folks, I think my time is up. Thank you for listening to me this morning. I hope you have a wonderful conference. And um, any questions, grab me. Thank you.